Hello, I'm Daniel Benjamin. As we survey the international landscape today and read of troops massing in Eastern Ukraine, new rounds of sanctions, expulsions of diplomats and the like, I'm sure I'm not the only person who is wondering if the elevator uh, that is the relationship between Vladimir Putin's Russia and the United States and Europe uh, is ever going to cease hurtling downward and will instead find a floor at which it can safely stop. To discuss that question, I'm delighted to welcome uh, to today's event, uh, Ambassador Stephen Pfeiffer, who will deliver an American Academy lecture entitled The Very Difficult Mr. Putin, How the West Should Respond. Uh, let me just uh, briefly introduce Steve Pfeiffer. He is currently a fellow at the Bosch Academy here in Berlin. He's also a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, where he was a scholar uh, in residence from 2008 to 2017. He's also an affiliate of the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford University. For most of his career, however, Steve Pfeiffer was a diplomat and a very distinguished one. For many years, he was a core member of the US government's brain trust on relations with Russia and the former Soviet states, as well as security and arms control. Um, late in the 1990s, Steve served as US ambassador to Kiev. Uh, just before that, he served on the National Security Council staff as special assistant to the president and senior director for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia. Uh, after his time in Kiev, he came back to the department, the State Department, and served as Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, with the portfolio that included Russia and Ukraine. And for America, Ru American Russian experts, uh, that is the equivalent of a hat trick. In addition to Ukraine, uh, Steve has served at the U.S. embassies in Warsaw, Moscow, and London, and with the U.S. delegation to the negotiation on intermediate range weapons in, uh, in Geneva, intermediate range nuclear forces uh, that met in Geneva. His commentary has aired uh, on these issues on national public radio, on the PBS NewsHour, CNN, Fox News, uh, BBC and elsewhere. And his articles uh, have appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, National Interest, Politico, Moscow Times and the Kiev Post. He is the author of The Eagle and the Trident, U.S.-Ukraine Relations in Turbulent Times, and he was the co-author of The Opportunity, Next Steps in Reducing Nuclear Arms. On a personal note, I'm uh, really excited to host Steve at the Academy and hear what he has to say about what's driving Russian behavior, because I've been pestering him with these questions uh, for many, many years. Uh, I had the good fortune of working with Steve during the Clinton administration, and we actually shared an office suite in the old executive office building uh, many years ago. Later, we worked down the hall from one another at the Brookings Center on the US and Europe. So this is, uh, uh, this is a reunion of sorts. And, um, and it's great that it's happening in Berlin. Uh, let me just give you a quick roadmap for the event. Uh, after Steve speaks for 25 or 30 minutes, we'll have uh, a Q&A session. I'll put some questions to him. You are free to submit any questions you like in the Q&A area in, on your Zoom screen. Uh, don't bother trying to raise your hand. That feature is not active. Uh, I will do my best to get to as many of the questions uh, that I can, and um, I'm sure we'll uh, get um, very informed uh, answers to them. So with that, let me turn the virtual podium over to Ambassador Pfeiffer. It's great to have you here, Steve. First of all, Dan, thank you very much for that very generous introduction um, and, and also the opportunity to speak. I, I have to chuckle a little bit when you mentioned the hat trick, senior director at the NSC, ambassador to Ukraine, and then de uh, the assistant secretary at state. And I chuckle about that and say timing is everything. Uh, I'm glad I did it in my timing because uh, all of my successors in those positions got the privilege of testifying to Congress in the impeachment trial. <laughs> <laughs> So let me begin my talk with the observation that relations between the United States and Russia and more broadly between the West and Russia are at their lowest point in decades. And that's a universal assessment. You're going to hear that in Washington. You'll hear that in Moscow. You'll hear that in European capitals. And it's, it's the correct assessment. Now, I'm not going to say it's all Russia's fault. I think there are times where you could point to mistakes made by the United States and the West over the past couple of decades. But I would argue that much of the responsibility for the decline that we have seen lies with Vladimir Putin, the Kremlin, and the policy choices they have made, particularly over the course of the last 10 years. So what I want to do this evening is look at three things. First of all, uh, what does Putin want? Uh, 
Second, what's Russia's status? What's his ability to deliver on his desires? And third, I'll talk about how the West should respond. Now, let me make a note here, and it's kind of a caution which I give myself, is when I talk about what does Putin want, we probably shouldn't overly personalize Russian policy. Uh, but I would argue that Vladimir Putin is by far the most dominant leader in Moscow since Joseph Stalin. Uh, and to be sure, I don't think he can completely ignore his inner circle, but most of that inner circle in the Kremlin comes from the Soloviki group, uh, security services, uh, the for Federal Security Service, the Foreign Intelligence Service, or the GRU, uh, Russian intelligence. And that group thinks a lot like Mr. Putin. And there is one big difference that you have now that you didn't have, say, from the 1950s up until the collapse of the Soviet Union is there is no Politburo that's capable of firing Mr. Putin, as was capable of firing and removing from his job Nikita Khrushchev back in 1964. So let me talk a little bit about what it was Mr. Putin and what do the Kremlin want. First of all, they want the ability to manage Russia's economic system and its political system free of Western advice and free of Western criticism. And that's a change from Boris Yeltsin. Back in the early 90s, Yeltsin had many flaws, but he basically opened up Russia and was looking for advice. And you had lots of Western non-governmental organizations in there uh, doing things to try to help modernize Russia and, and basically help Russia make the transition from the, the directed economy it had into the communist system to more of a market economy and a pluralistic political system. But it was pretty clear when Mr. Putin came to office, that was back in 2000, early on they began talking about managed democracy, which they would have the facade of democracy. So for example, there were elections that were generally free and fair, uh, but there were limitations on who got to run. Uh, and you had this system where there was systemic opposition, opposition that was okay. So the Liberal Democratic Party of Russia, uh, one of the more otter groups there, you know, was acceptable as an opposition, in part because on every key issue, it basically voted with the government. Later on, you had a transition where they stopped talking about managed democracy, and the objective was sovereign democracy, which basically translated to what happens in Russia is Russian's business and no one else's. I think though we've seen a change though over the course of the last year, which is the veneer seems to be coming off and you're moving from a regime that was interested in managed or sovereign democracy to is fairly uh, comfortable with overt repression. And that may reflect the fact that the Slovakia are calling the shots and they don't care what the West thinks about what goes on within Russia. But you've seen it in the treatment of Alexei Navalny, both his poisoning attempt, I mean, he would now be dead had a pilot not taken the initiative to make an emergency landing to get him to a hospital. You've seen it in mass arrests of protesters over the last six months, and you've seen it in the enactment and then the implementation of laws on foreign agents, on undesirable organizations, and then in declaring organizations extremists that are designed to shut down non-governmental organizations, both foreign and domestic, but also to designed to uh, pressure the media. And there really is increasingly less and less space for the non-systemic opposition. So Navalny's folks now, are being told that if they're not careful, they can be subject to criminal sanction because they were carrying activities of an extremist organization and Navalny's organization has now been determined to be extremist. And in a way, and this is unfortunate, but if you look at Russia domestically, it's beginning to look a bit more like the Soviet Union. So that's the first thing, they wanna have the right to determine what goes on in Russia without criticism. The second goal, what does Mr. Putin come in one is, they want a sphere of influence in the post-Soviet space. Uh, when this concept came out publicly, uh, Dmitry Medvedev was president, this was in 2008, and he talked about a sphere of privileged interests for, the so for Russia in the Soviet post-Soviet space. Now, I don't believe Mr. Putin wants to recreate the Soviet Union. Uh, uh, that would be expensive. The Russian Federation would, would end up basically subsidizing all of the other republics. And I don't think the Russians want that. But what Moscow does want is they want friendly governments in the post-Soviet space. They want economies that are open to Russian business, including the corrupted business interests that may come in. And then third, they want neighbors that will defer to Russia on ge major geopolitical questions. And that would include how far that country goes in its relationship with NATO or the European Union. Uh, and you see this now in the conflict that's been going on for seven years now between Russia and Ukraine. The Russians' ideal goal 
is to bring Russia, is to bring Ukraine back into Russia's sphere of influence. That's really hard to see happening. I mean, after seven years of conflict, after more than 13,000 have been killed in fighting in Donbass, it's very hard to see any Ukrainian political leader saying, we're now going to turn back away from the West and back towards Russia. And I would actually argue that over the last seven years, the Kremlin's actions and Kremlin policies have been counterproductive for Russian goals. What they have done is they've consolidated their sense of Ukrainian identity. Uh, in 2014, uh, after the Russian seizure of Crimea and the beginning of the conflict in Donbass, when I visited Kyiv, I had a Ukrainian friend tell me, Vladimir Putin has succeeded where centuries of Ukrainian nationalists failed, is he's created this sense of Ukrainian national identity. And I think it's across the country. And what you have in Ukraine now is very different from when I served in the late 1990s. In the late 1990s, you had among the Ukrainian nationalists in the West, some who were ardently anti-Russian. But for the bulk of the Russia, Ukrainian population, they were either well disposed towards Russia or they were ambivalent. And I believe that's changed. You now have a, a significant chunk of the Ukrainian population that is hostile towards Russia. And I think that's a strategic failure on the part of uh, the Kremlin, is what they have done is they have pushed Ukraine away and they pushed Ukraine closer to the West. So if Russia can't get Ukraine back in its sphere of influence, what is it seeking to do? And I would argue that if you look at the conflict in Donbass, the Russians are using that as a mechanism to put pressure on the government in Kyiv, to destabilize it, divert its attention, distract it, to make it harder for the government in Kyiv to do the sorts of internal reforms and anti-corruption measures and things that they need to do to build a successful Ukraine. And when I talk about a successful Ukraine, I'm talking about a Ukraine not that just has uh, a growing economy uh, and, and rising living standards, but has what they do have now. I mean, there are real politics in Ukraine. It's a pluralistic system. It's by far not a perfect democratic system, but there are clashes of interests of the kind that you simply don't see in Russia. And I think the Kremlin sees that kind of Ukraine if the Ukrainians could make a success story. And that's not only getting their politics right, but a growing economy. The Kremlin regards that kind of Ukraine as a threat. Because if you have that on the Western border of Russia, the Russians might start asking, why can't we have the same political voice, the same political space that Ukrainians have? And so when you look at this conflict that Russia is conducting against Ukraine, you know, it's not just about a sphere of influence and pulling Ukraine into it. It's not just about geopolitics, but it's also about Russian domestic politics and to some extent regime survival. Now, I would also argue, you, you know, you see this, you know, you, We've watched this in the continuing pressure between Russia and Ukraine. The military buildup that took up took place in April was fairly alarming. What is perhaps also a bit alarming is all the Russians said, all the Russians said they were drawing down. In fact, they still maintain a lot of equipment and a lot of forces in that area. And it may well be that Mr. Putin has not yet decided finally what he wants to do. This is somebody who likes to have options and with forces near the Ukrainian border, he has options that he might not have otherwise. But more broadly, I think making the problem worse uh, in Russian-Ukrainian uh, uh, relations is I don't believe the Kremlin understands Ukraine well. About 10 years ago when I was in Moscow, I was at a dinner and there was a former senior Soviet or retired Soviet official who was still pretty plugged in. And I asked him, does anybody in the Kremlin understand Ukraine? And he thought for a moment, he said, yes, there's one person who really understands Ukraine well. And he paused and he said, but nobody listens to him. And I think we've actually seen that. Uh, Vladimir Putin, the last time he was in Kyiv was in 2013. He went there to commemorate the 1,025th anniversary of Kiev and Rus, the state that both Russia and Ukraine claim as their founding state. But it, it, its acceptance of Christianity, which had major implications for religion in both Russia and Ukraine. And he gives a speech where he says, we are one people. And he's repeated that formulation a number of times since then. And that's tone deaf in Ukraine because for a lot of Ukrainians, what they hear is you've denied my culture, my history, my language. Uh, another example where I think the Russians don't understand Ukraine was in 2014, whereas after the seizure of Crimea and then the conflict began in Donbass, this concept was talked about in Moscow of Novorossiya, the idea that perhaps 40% of Eastern and Southern Ukraine would break away, either declare independence or seek to follow Crimea, you know, seek to try to somehow link with Russia. 
It didn't happen. And by May of 2014, it was clear it wasn't going to happen. But still in the Kremlin, they held on to that notion until the fall. And, and I worry about the fact that the Russians don't seem to understand Ukraine that well, because that kind of misunderstanding leads to miscalculation. And as I said, I think they've made some strategic mistakes. So in addition to having a sphere of influence in the post-Soviet space, the third thing that the Kremlin wants is recognition of Russia as a great power. And for them, a seat at the table is important. Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister, often says no major problem in the world can be resolved without Russia being there. And it's important for Russia to be there, even if they can't bring much to resolution of the particular question at hand. Respect is also important. By many reports, Vladimir Putin was usually aggrieved. He took great umbrage when uh, President Obama said, Russia's a regional power. Uh, but actually, Mr. Obama was right. Uh, Russia really has a limited ability to act outside of the post-Soviet space. And I, I would argue that even in some ways, economic ways, now China is now much more able to project political and economic power uh, than Russia is. And when the Russians do use their power, all too often it's a power to disrupt, not to build. So, so take Syria, for example. You've seen Russian military forces there conduct some fairly brutal operations. The Russians have used Syria as a proving ground for new weapons and also to test tactics. But every time the question arises of, is it time to look at rebuilding Syria, basically providing assistance to rehabilitate the country so refugees can come back, the first thing you hear from a Russian official is the, EU, the European Union should take the lead on that. Fourth thing that I think that the Kremlin wants and Mr. Putin wants is they want to change the, the post-Cold War settlement. Because in their view, the institutional development since the 1990s disadvantages Russian interests. Uh, particularly, they see this in reference to NATO and the NATO enlargement. Um, Dan and I were both at the uh, White House when President Clinton worked on enlarging NATO. But in parallel with that, there was a second track that was designed to engage with Russia. And, and things were done to try to make that enlargement of NATO non-threatening. Statements like there would be no nuclear weapons deployed on the territory of new members, and there would be no substantial combat forces, conventional forces, deployed on the territory of new members or permanently stationed there. And that didn't happen. You had no real combat forces deployed on the territory of new members until 2014 after the seizure of Crimea and Russian military involvement in Donbass. But I would argue that Russia had opportunities to develop cooperation and a cooperative relationship with NATO, and they didn't really take advantage of it. Now, on the Western side, we perhaps could have been more creative, uh, but there really was in Moscow a view that you come up with the ideas, and I, I believe the Kremlin did not fully take advantage of that opportunity. We also see how the Kremlin seeks to dismiss the European Union. Uh, we saw it in the treatment of the high representative when he was in Moscow in February. And this reflects a, pro, a policy prevalence on the part of the Russians to deal with states bilaterally. Because when you're talking to European states individually, Russia's size matters, and there's an opportunity to exploit differences between European countries. One thing I believe that the Russians don't want to see is a strong unified European Union that can act as a global player, because that would be a larger uh, uh, interlocutor and one that would actually, in many ways, mobilize great strength compared to Russia. And so related to this area, with this dissatisfaction with the post-Cold War settlement, you see Russia's effort to weaken the West using disinformation, cyber techniques, social media, and kind of this constant campaign. I'll ask the question, were we doomed to get here? I mean, Vladimir Putin actually in his early years, the early 2000s, seemed interested in good relations with the West, but quickly, there was, I think, one other issue that was problematic in the U.S.-Russia context, which is after a couple of good years between President Bush and President Putin, in 2003, the relationship began to drift a bit. And that was because President Bush became focused on Iraq and President Putin became focused on his domestic issues. And one thing I think we've seen in relations between Washington and Moscow that goes back decades is the relationship needs management at the top to set the tone, to set the agenda, and then to encourage the bureaucracies to work and deliver. And with that not happening in 2003, 2004, it began to drift. And then we saw a downturn in 2007 when Mr. Putin made his famous speech at the Munich Security Conference. 
Briefly with the reset that was launched by the Obama administration, uh, there was a, a good period. And I would actually argue that the reset was a success as long as you say that the reset ended probably at the end of 2010. It delivered the New START Treaty. It delivered Russian cooperation on supporting uh, US and NATO forces in Afghanistan. And it delivered more Russian pressure on Iran uh, to give up its uh, nuclear weapons program. Uh, but you know, from Mr. Putin's view, and I think the reset really became undone when Mr. Putin came back uh, to the presidency in 2012. And, and here was somebody who had a lot of grievances. Uh, famously, when he had his first meeting with President Obama in 2009, the first 45, 50 minutes were basically Mr. Putin reeling off all the things that the West and the United States had done uh, to, uh, to diminish Russia. And when Mr. Putin came back to the presidency, it was interesting in that in his first two terms in the early 2000s, regime legitimacy was based on economics. The Russian economy was growing at 68% per year, the price of oil was up. And you talk to Russians who would say, Mr. Putin has a social compact with us. We understand we're not going to have much in the way of a political voice, but we are going to have a growing economy and rising living standards, our incomes will go up. When he came back to the presidency in 2012, the economic picture was much more grim. And you see he was talking about nationalism, Russia is a great power because he couldn't deliver on the, econ the economy. And I think increasingly he has chosen to portray and define the United States and NATO as adversaries. And there seems to be this sense on the part of Mr. Putin that the West is out to get him. When he talks about the orange revolution or the Maidan revolution in Ukraine, or the Rose Revolution in Georgia, or the Tulip Revolution in Kyrgyzstan, he doesn't see those as reflecting agency on the part of the Ukrainians or the Georgians or the Kyrgyz, but these are all orchestrated by the CIA and Western intelligence services. And, and the goal is basically to test the mechanisms so that there can be a color revolution in Russia. Uh, that sounds to me fairly fantastic, but Mr. Putin says it so often I worry that he has now begun to believe it. And, and I don't know how we change that. But it, with this buildup of hostility towards the West, he's now turned towards China and, and basically accepted with China a relationship in, with, in which Russia is now the junior partner. Now, looking forward, uh, Russia may have a hard time uh, maintaining the stance because I do believe that Russia is a state in decline. The economy is stagnant. Uh, the real standards of living have just declined by about 10% since 2012. And it's hard to see a readiness on the part of the Kremlin for a course change. Uh, Mr. Putin has in foreign reserves and also in a sovereign wealth fund, probably on the order of $600 billion. And he hasn't touched that despite the economic difficulties we've seen over the past year with the pandemic. And I think there's a reluctance to do what most economists, including Russian economists, say needs to be done, which is some opening of the Russian economy. And the concern is that opening up the economy would also mean a more open system. And that seems to be very much in a different direction from what the Kremlin has tried to impose on Russia over the last 10 years. And you see this in a, a couple of examples. One is Skolkova. Skolkova was announced with great fanfare in 2008, 2009. It was going to be Russia's Silicon Valley. Anybody hear much about Skolkova now? No. And I don't think that was a failure of technology. I, I, there are smart Russians. Uh, you go to Silicon Valley, and there's lots of Russians there. You know, they can come up with ideas. But I don't think Silicon Valley succeeds just because of smart people. But it had the right infrastructure, legal infrastructure, rule of law, contract enforcement, patents. At one point, they were talking about Skolkova making the patent-free zone. If Silicon Valley was patent-free, Silicon Valley would not be anything like it is today. But also you didn't have the financial infrastructure. Venture capitalists prepared to pump in money, $5 billion, go build the next Google. You don't have that in Russia. And the Russians, I think, and the Kremlin is not prepared to create that kind of system and that doomed Skolkova. The other point I would make about the Russian economy is, and I usually ask this when I give uh, lectures in person, does anybody in the audience have a car or a computer or a phone or clothes or household furniture made in Russia. The difficulty for Russia economically is they don't build much that the world wants to buy unless you're in the market for military weapons or nuclear power reactors. 
most of the stuff that Russia exports comes out of the ground, oil, gas, and minerals. And I don't think that's a formula for success for a Russian economy, particularly when you look at the West, in particular Europe, moving away from fossil fuels. A complicating factor for Russia is declining demographics. There are 145 million Russians today. By 2015, the UN projects it'll be down to 135 million and perhaps as low as 128 million. And we already see, a Russia already is going through the experience of uh, a growing population of uh, pensioners. Uh, the labor force is contracting. The number of uh, Russian males who turned of draftable age in 2017 was about half of what it was in 2006. So there are these economic pressures. Interestingly, the one freedom that Mr. Putin hasn't touched is he's not stopped people from leaving. And I think there's a calculation that the ability to leave, that's a pressure valve, it releases that pressure. But those that are leaving tend to be in their 20s and early 30s, they tend to be smart young people. And even the uh, Russian statistics office said that the number who were leaving last year was five times what it was 10 years ago. And, and that's sort of valuable people. It's a valuable resource for a country, but Mr. Putin doesn't seem to care. And you also have a country with, I think, a, a global position that's not particularly strong. Uh, you look at the relationship with China, and I think it's one of convenience, but I'm not sure how deep it is. And there are some potential, I believe, for some tensions between China. Take Central Asia, the five stands, an area that Russia considers its backyard in the post-Soviet space, uh, but Chinese investment, Chinese money dwarfs what the Russians can provide. And at some point, I think there's gonna be tension there uh, between that clash between the Russian political interest and just how much China's put into that area. And then if the Chinese then try to convert that investment into political influence. Now, so I, the point is to say Russia is not 10 feet tall, but on the other hand, it's not going to disappear. It still has the power to challenge. And I would argue that Mr. Putin has actually pay, played a weak hand fairly well. But I think he's making choices now that are going to mean a much weaker Russia in 10, 15, 20 years down the road. And it reflects what I think you have on his part and also on the part of those around him, a very much a short-term view. Uh, now, let me ask, are we going to have Vladimir Putin forever, or at least until 2036? And I would say, I'm not sure Mr. Putin has decided. <laughs> I think last year he wanted the Constitution to change because it gives him options. The one thing he did not want is he did not want to be regarded as a lame duck. So by creating the opportunity by changing the Constitution so he could run in 2024, and then again in 2030, he's given himself that option. And it was interesting, I mean, this, this shows how fast things can move when Mr. Putin wants to change. It was on a Tuesday where at a meeting of the Duma, the Russian uh, Federal uh, Assembly, uh, somebody proposed, let's do away with this requirement so Mr. Putin can run. And he said, that sounds like a good idea. Six days later, it had been approved by the Federal Assembly, the Federal Council, and the 80 odd regional legislatures of Russia for an adapt adaptation to the constitution. But it, they wanted to go beyond that, so they then put that uh, constitutional change to a referendum, which was not required. And it was interesting, it was packaged with a lot of other changes. So it was not just the change on the ability of Mr. Putin to run for two more terms, but it had things like guaranteed pensions, uh, minimum wages, things that were bread and butter items that people would want to vote for. And of course it passed. Uh, but I still don't exclude that Mr. Putin doesn't want to run in 2024. Uh, and if you look, uh, I think he's bored with some aspects of the job. Um, I watched his parts of his last speech that he gave, the, his State of the Nation speech. He doesn't seem to be much interested anymore in the economics or the domestic side of things. I think foreign policy attracts him, uh, but a lot of parts of the job don't seem to be of much interest. But then it comes to the question, what does he want in a successor? And I think he would want two things. He wants somebody who will share his vision of Russia and what Russia should be, which I don't think is a particularly attractive country, overly centralized power, authoritarian, and then trying to exercise uh, outside weight in, in foreign relations. So, but he wants that person to have his vision, and he also wants somebody who could protect him and his close cronies in the same way that Boris Yeltsin chose Mr. Putin to be his successor because Putin could protect the Yeltsin family. And it may well be he hasn't found that person yet. I think in 2008 to 2012, uh, Dmitry Medvedev, who was president at that time, uh, he had an opportunity to be tested. 
it appears that he failed the test. But anybody who comes in after Mr. Putin, uh, and, and that's whether it happens in, in three years or whether it happens in nine years or whether he gets hit by a bus and happens next week, is likely going to be somebody who shares his outlook. And I think from the perspective of the West, we can't affect this. We don't understand this. I mean, the Kremlin now is perhaps more opaque than it was during Soviet times. I talked to a former U.S. ambassador to Russia, and his observation was, it goes, it's really interesting. He said, back in the Soviet times, at least once a year, you had the Great October Revolution Parade, and the Politburo would line up on the Lenin mausoleum to watch the parade. And you could say, ah, that person there, he's moved two spaces close to the center. You know, he's on the uptick. And that person's moved three spaces down. He's on his way out. We don't have that. It's an opaque system. We can't affect it, and we shouldn't bother to try. So how should the West respond? I think, first of all, it's important to accept, and we need to accept, that the Kremlin sees the relationship that it has with the United States, but also with other Western countries, in part in adversarial terms. Now, that doesn't mean we can't deal with Russia, and, and we can when interests converge and overlap. But we should understand that as we're dealing with Russia on some issues, there are going to be other issues where Russia is pursuing active efforts to weaken the West. Now, President Biden, I actually think, could be quite positive for U.S.-Russia relations. Uh, Mr. Trump, um, I, I, there's no doubt in my mind uh, that uh, had the Kremlin had its way, Mr. Trump would have won re-election uh, last year. I mean, from Moscow's point of view, you know, he was widening divisions within America. He was calling, causing discord in the alliances, both in the EU, Europe and also in Asia. Uh, and he was generally, I think, um, degrading the American image overseas. So if you're in the Kremlin, what's not to like if that's happening to what you see as your Glavni Protivnik, your main opponent? But I would also argue at the same time, uh, Mr. Trump did not a single thing, there was no single achievement that was positive for U.S.-Russia relations. And I think Biden actually can offer some things that may be pluses for the Kremlin. First of all, he needs clarity in U.S. policy. Uh, when Mr. Trump was president, I can't think of any job in Moscow that must have been harder than being the Kremlin watcher in the Kremlin. I'm sorry, the America watcher in the Kremlin. Because how do you explain to Putin an American policy that on the one hand is pretty tough. It continued sanctions. It in fact increased sanctions on Russia. It continued to bolster NATO. It began continued military assistance to Ukraine, including lethal military assistance. How do you synchronize that, explain that against Donald Trump, who is reluctant to challenge the Russians or Mr. Putin on anything, uh, doesn't seem ready to criticize the Russians and keeps talking about this good relationship? I, with Biden, you're going to see a policy and a president who are in sync. The Russians are not going to like all aspects of that policy, but they will understand that. And the good thing to my mind is it reduces the prospect for miscalculation. A second thing that is a plus for the relationship is President Biden has clearly indicated he believes in guardrails to manage the competitive or adversarial aspects of the relationship. So on his first full day in office, he agreed to a Russian offer that had been on the table for more than a year to extend the new Strategic Arms Reductions Treaty uh, until 2026. And his administration has said they want to go beyond that. They would like to explore strategic stability talks, look at new nego nuclear negotiations. And these are questions where I believe, particularly when relations are largely adversarial, Washington and Moscow share an interest in trying to control that competition. The third thing I would argue would be good for the relationship is President Biden is going to be a serious interlocutor. He's not going to come to a meeting, and I, I suspect the meeting will happen next month, he, but he's not going to come to that meeting and just ad lib, go with his gut. You know, he's going to prepare, and he's going to be a very different interlocutor from Mr. Trump, but I think he's also going to be one that understands some of these issues are really tough, and they're going to take time to address. So I, I think Biden represents some positive things. It's not going to be a reset. The goal they've declared is they want to have a stable and predictable relationship. And quite frankly, that would be pretty good at this point. Now, the policy that the Biden administration is pursuing seems to have two parts. One is pushing back against egregious Russian misbehavior. So you've seen support for you in Ukraine uh, has been uh, uh, basically uh, emphasized. You've seen sanctions 
for activities, the 2020 election interference and solar winds, although to some extent that was old business. I mean, those were violations that took place before the Biden administration took office. And I would actually argue that those sanctions were, were relatively light. But there were two things I think and I hope Moscow took note of is that when announcing those sanctions in April, the president also signed a new executive order on sanctions, which creates a broad range of activities that could be subject to sanctions in the future. And the second point was that for the first time, the United States or the Treasury Department sanctioned sovereign Russian debt. And it basically said American financial, financial institutions cannot directly purchase sovereign debt. Now, that's kind of a light slap at one point because it doesn't prohibit American institutions from buying that debt from a middleman. But that's the first time sovereign debt has been sanctioned. And I think there's a message there to the Russians that uh, sovereign debt is no longer out of play. And, and so in the Biden administration, there is a readiness to look at other sanctions that could be targeted either at individuals or state-owned enterprises, uh, if necessary. Uh, somebody once told me that on a scale of one to 10, we're only at about number three in terms of the pain sanctions could inflict. And I think they are hurting. Um, uh, one calculation that we've seen says about the Russian economy takes a hit of about 1% of gross domestic product per year due to sanctions. And, and that's an impact when your economy is only growing maybe one and a half to at most 2% per year. Some of these sanctions are also going to apply only in the future. So for example, there's no sanctions on oil now, except that Western companies are prohibited from providing either technology or financing to help Russia develop new oil fields. And that has no impact now, but as Russia depletes existing fields, it's going to have a big impact on Russia's ability to come up with substitutes. And, and the sanctions do, you know, can be quite painful. Uh, you may recall back about two years ago, uh, they sanctioned Rosal, which is the large Russian aluminum company. And within several hours, the company had lost 40% of its value on the London Stock Exchange. Uh, now, the sanctions turned out to be a lot more painful in different ways, and it basically caused havoc in the global aluminum market, so they subsequently amended that, but it did show that Western sanctions targeted at large state enterprises can have an impact. But while being prepared to hold Russia to account and apply sanctions, the administration has also made very clear it's ready to cooperate where interests converge. And, and there's several areas out there. There's arms control. That, I believe, will be perhaps the number one topic when the two presidents meet in June, assuming that they do meet, which I think is quite likely. Climate change is an area where both countries have an interest. Afghanistan, uh, with the United States and NATO leaving Afghanistan militarily in, in September, both Moscow and Washington have an interest in not seeing havoc, not seeing the Taliban regain power. And I would actually argue that the Russian interest is probably greater uh, since Afghanistan you know, right borders on Central Asia, and, and, and they worry about that in their backyard. Uh, I would say counterterrorism should be an area, but I think Dan can attest this has been an area where uh, certainly I think US and Russian interests often converge, but having really actionable cooperation has not been uh, what one might hope. Now, it seems to me that the meeting last night between Secretary Blinken and Foreign Minister Lavrov, that they begin to frame out the issues for a Biden-Putin summit. Uh, there'll be a meeting uh, shortly between uh, the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, and uh, Mr. Patrushev, his Russian counterpart. And, and my guess is at some point, then, you're going to see announcements coming out of Washington and Moscow that when the president comes to Europe, he will meet with Putin. And the question in my mind is, and I think this will be an opportunity for the president to say, here are issues that we're going to push back on. Don't try to get the Putin to confess to past crimes, but just draw a line and say, in the future, there will be consequences. They can explore and try to define issues on arms control, for example, where the sides might begin to move forward. And I think the, the, the big question, which we don't know yet, is could they go beyond those sorts of issues to some of the really hard questions that burden the relationship, differences over cyber, over Ukraine, or over Syria? Uh, and I think, for example, you know, it's hard to see a major improvement in U.S.-Russia relations without something positive happening between Russia and Ukraine. But it does seem to me that the Biden administration is trying to keep expectations for that kind of progress limited, which is probably the right place to be now. So just a couple last comments. I, you know, I think the U.S. is going to want to cooperate with Europe on its Russia policy. A coordinated Western response is more likely to have impact in Moscow 
Germany is going to be seen as a key player in this, both within the EU, but also in its own right. And so I, Russia is going to be a conversation topic for bilateral discussions. And, and I guess my observation after being here for four months, which may not be deep enough, is that the German assessment of Russia and Russian policy has evolved quite a bit. Uh, within uh, the government, um, they probably wouldn't use the term threat, which is, might be used at the State Department or the National Security Council in Washington, but they now talk about the Russian challenge. And I think the question may be, though, is German policy catching up with the assessment? And, and my sense is that on the European side or here in Germany, they may say, fine, on the Americans, you know, the pushback makes sense, but don't uh, short shrift the engagement part. And I think the American attitude would be uh, exactly the opposite, which is fine, engagement with Russia makes sense, but you've also got to be prepared to push back. And, and I do believe that Germany and Europe need to ask, you know, what actions they're prepared to accept. You know, interference in domestic politics, you know, killing a regime opponents in the tear garden or on the streets of Salisbury, you know, blowing up Czech's arm depots, you know, continuing use of force uh, to advance a political agenda with Ukraine. Uh, and I don't think that these are really acceptable actions. And if, if that's a view, my, I, my recommendation is I think Germany and Europe should take a look at how it can bolster its effort to push back against Russia. Because what we've been doing the last decade hasn't worked that well. And we've got to figure out better ways, I think, to affect the cost benefit calculation in the Kremlin to make them understand that certain actions will have costs that might make them reconsider some of the policies they're looking at. So I think a successful Russian policy, and this I would define in terms of one that moves a US-Russia and a West-Russia relationship to a degree of stability and predictability, that's gonna be complex. It's gonna require this combination of pushback and sanctions, but also engaging, including on some hard questions. And it's not gonna be the easiest policy to manage. But Moscow does not appear uncomfortable with that mix and I would argue that the West also should not be uncomfortable with it and should be prepared to pursue it. And so, Dan, let me stop at that point. I'd be happy to take questions. Steve, thanks for uh, a lucid, comprehensive, and really thoughtful presentation. I have a million questions. We don't have a time. We don't have time for all my questions, but let me uh, just uh, put uh, uh, a few to you. And, and as the Q and A uh, queue fills up, so. Um, I guess the first one that I would want to ask is, do we have any indications that the Russians are prepared to be restrained in terms of their meddling in Western democracies or in other democracies around the world? Uh, or, um, you know, is it a plausible hypothesis that uh, Putin sees this as the strongest card he has to play in terms of um, securing uh, the goals that he set for himself. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I think the Russians are going to continue to use that tool, both in the United States and Europe. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, I, it does appear that their effort, for example, to interfere in the 2020 US presidential election was much less than in the 2016 election. I mean, if they hacked into anybody's mail servers, you know, they were dumping tens of thousands of emails uh, publicly. Uh, now, whether that was because you know, they didn't get into the servers or because they decided that that was perhaps a case in which they had overplayed their hand, I can't tell. But, but, but I do think that um, that meddling will continue. We In the West, we have to figure out a way uh, to the extent that we want to end that is to sort of make them understand that there will be costs. And this is one where I guess I would advocate uh, a use of sanctions that probably is going to be too hard for Europe to do and for the US and the European combination to do. But right now we're in a pattern where the Russians commit some egregious act and then the sanctions are imposed as punishment with the goal of trying to compel the Russians to undo that act. Well, in theory, deterrence is always more effective than compellence. And I do wonder if there could not be an effort by the West to convey privately, you don't want to put the Russians in a public spot, but some indication that if you do X, this is what will happen. And, and then again, trying to affect that calculation in the Kremlin of the costs and benefits, uh, and, and then try to dissuade them from taking certain steps as opposed to punish them after the fact. 
But my guess is that among the, the, the 20 odd countries of the European Union and working that, it's coming up with that list and that specific of this will lead to this, whereas I think most governments will say, well, no, we want to have the flexibility to decide in the actual event. It may make it hard to do, but the West may be giving up a tool that, that might be a more effective use of sanctions than we've seen over the last uh, seven years. Um, so that's a, a really interesting response. So um, when I talk to um, defense, uh, people who focus on the defense sector, uh, some of them, especially in the United States, um, who may not focus as much on the politics as you do, but look at the overall tenor of the relationship, um, say, well, you know, are we prepared for uh, Russia really challenging the viability of NATO? You know, we've got we've got these Baltic countries, for example. Are we really going to defend them? What do we do if the if the if let's say um, Putin sees his economy continuing to sink in the way that you have described, and continues to sort of see the exercise of power and the um, and the imperative to establish Russia as a uh, as a genuinely global power requires him to, you know, do things that in the past we would have thought were crazy. You know, I I remember you. Uh, there used to be a saying among uh, uh, you uh, uh, former criminologists and Russia uh, observers that anything worth doing is worth overdoing if you're Russia. And I'm curious what you think the chances of a mis miscalculation along these lines uh, would be. Yeah, no, I, I think it's there, but it, but it's small. Um, now, 10 years ago, I think most people said it was a zero probability, but what's happened in Ukraine has affected calculations. But, but having said that, I, I do believe that the Russians understand when they talk about a sphere of influence, they don't like it, but they mentally exclude the Baltic states. They understand the Baltic states are sort of lost to the West. They can't get them back. And so I, I do hope that that factors into their calculation, because I do believe if there was Russian military action against Latvia, Lithuania, or Estonia, uh, there would be a NATO military response, and the United States would be prepared. Because the alternative, if there's no response, uh, I think NATO's over. I mean, you know, if there is an unwillingness to take that military action to defend a member, uh, there's just a complete collapse of confidence. And while the Russians have been very active in using, and I, I think the term goes in and out of vogue, hybrid, you know, the social media and cyber, things like that, I, I'm not sure that the Russians still want a face-to-face -face military conflict with the West. Now, in the Baltic states, you know, likely because of geography, they could prevail initially, you know, but if NATO was prepared, it would take, I think, several months, but NATO could muster conventional power, I think, to get the Baltic states back. And I think at the end of the day, the Russians still understand that their military capabilities in a face-to-face -face conflict with the West, you know, it's not something that they want to go to. So they'll try to use the hybrid techniques, uh, but, and, and while I don't totally exclude, I think we still have to be thinking about what might happen to the Baltics, which is one reason perhaps maybe you, know, you have now in each of the Baltic states in Poland, you have these NATO multinational battalions of about 12 to 1300 troops. It might be worth bolstering those, you know, maybe taking them up to 2,000 each, which I think would be reassuring uh, to the Baltic states and to Poland, but also it would make a thicker tripwire. And, and, and I do want the Russians uh, to understand, and I, I think in some way they do understand that going to one of these countries, they're going to be fighting many more than just the Baltic states. Yeah. A couple of years ago, uh, I heard a former uh, deputy director of the CIA uh, observed that uh, the space, in in his view, the space for an accident, the the, the possibility of a of a miscalculation of unintended clash or something, was greater now than it had been in the Cold War, and uh, really at any time in memory, because so many of the usual channels of communication. Uh, had been discontinued. Now, uh, what I take away from your talk is that even if those channels haven't yet been reconnected, uh, there is, we hope, a shared uh, understanding of 
kind of the physics of the universe that we're working in. But I'm curious as to whether you uh, share that view or how you'd assess that, because, you know, throughout the Cold War, uh, we had a terrible relationship, but we were always talking and we were always, um, you know, kind of doing due diligence on each other and making sure that we knew what the other was thinking and how we could deconflict really big problems. Yeah. yeah. Let me say on the channels, uh, I mean, first of all, I agree with the Obama administration that, that in 2014, you could not do business as usual. But I think in cutting the channels, we cut too many. Uh, it was a mistake, I believe, uh, by NATO, for example, to suspend the NATO-Russia Council. I mean, this was actually the time where you wanted to have that body come together and you wanted to have the military representatives to meet to make sure, at the least, it's an opportunity to communicate to the Russians NATO concerns and such. Uh, but also, you now have a situation which has really evolved since 2014 of many more interactions taking place in the air and at sea between NATO and Russian aircraft and, and, and warships. I mean, just yesterday, the American uh, Air Force, I guess, on Tuesday deployed four B-52 bombers to Marone Air Force Base in Spain. And one of them uh, yesterday visited the Baltic Sea and was escorted by a Russian fighter. And, and the militaries are normally pretty good about this, but I do worry that just the number of interactions and we need to be careful because in some of these situations, and I think of that, uh, the buzzings that taking place of American warships in the Baltic and the Black Sea, where the planes come, approach the ship in what looks like a pretty hostile manner, uh, in which a commander might be tempted to turn on not just his tracking radars, but his fire control radars. And we're putting an awful lot of responsibility on the shoulders of you know a 35 year old US Navy lieutenant commander and maybe a 29 year old uh, Russian uh, uh, MiG pilot. And you know a, an accident there can really spin out of control. So I, I think having more channels in place so that you can talk at when there's things. And they, 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 they're, they have worked in some cases, for example, in Syria, the deconfliction uh, hotline in Syria, what I understand is that when the US picks up that line to call the Russians, it never rings more than three times before there's an answer. And, and the military, and this is where, again, I think we're guidance from the top. I mean, if the two presidents sort of made the word down, okay, we're gonna be doing these things, these show of force exercises, but you know, we want you to do it in a way that minimizes accident or miscalculation. Militaries tend to be pretty responsive to that sort of thing. Uh, and so I think there's a chance to keep it under control. But, but I do worry that just because there are many more, there's much higher frequency of these encounters, you know, that the possibility goes up just uh, because of the uh, sheer number. So there are um, a whole bunch of questions on uh, a topic that I'm sure you're prepared for, and that is developments on uh, Nord Stream 2. Um, and everyone, I think, is sort of interested in your read of the situation. Um, uh, one one uh, viewer asks, what are we getting in return for lifting sanctions uh, on Nord Stream 2? Um, what, uh, what's your take on the, uh, on the recent activity on the administration's announcement that it was not going to uh, sanction uh, the, um, uh, the corporate entity that uh, is uh, building and going to operate the, uh, the pipeline? Yeah. Well, well, this was a dilemma con that was confronting the Biden administration from day one. You know, we just, the question was, when did it sort of burst into the open and it, as it has done in the last day? You know, but the, the dilemma is, on the one hand, the Biden administration opposes Nord Stream 2, and they're under tremendous pressure from both Democrats and Republicans to stop it. But on the other hand, the Biden administration looks at a relationship with Germany and the European Union. Both those relations were badly damaged by four years of uh, Mr. Trump in the White House. And it wants to rebuild that relationship. It sees Germany as a key partner. And so taking a step that would mean sanctioning uh, comp certain companies uh, would make it very difficult to get back to a better relationship with Germany and might provoke a rift between with Berlin, but also might have an impact of uniting the Europeans against the US because the European Union does not like uh, extraterritorial application of US sanctions. So, so that's the dilemma. 
And I think you've seen it. I mean, the president, when he gave his press conference at the end of April, got the question. He was asked, well, what about Nord Stream 2? And the first thing he said is, it's a complex issue. We've got allied interests involved here. And, and so I, I think at the end of the day, what the Biden administration looked at and said, look, the pipeline's 95% complete. An argument I've heard from Germans, which I'm not, I, I'm not, I am not unsympathetic to, is they said, look, you know, you didn't start talking about sanctions until 18 months ago, by which time the pipeline was 95% complete, 10 billion euros sunk into it. And a concern here in Berlin is if the Germans now stop it, does that mean that Germany could be liable for part or all of those 10 billion euros? I think there's also a political dimension here that Washington may be sensitive to, which is with a large part of the Christian Democrats and the social Democrats favoring the pipeline. And I think that that support for the pipeline probably hardened uh, when Mr. Trump was president, just because of the difficult nature of the US-German relationship then. Getting that those parties to reverse that stance four months out from the national election, it, it's really hard to see that. So I think there's sensitivity in Washington to the politics here. What I believe has to happen now in Berlin, and I think there's some discussions going on, but they need to, they need to get more specific, is there needs to be some sensitivity in Berlin to that there's a political problem now for the Biden administration. And it's going to have to, it would be very helpful for the Biden administration to say, there is this thing out there, a benefit I would argue for Ukraine and perhaps Poland, that Germany helps secure, that justifies the waiver of the sanctions. And I'll give you a couple of examples. One example, and these would be Ukraine specific. You know, uh, right now there's a contract that Gazprom has to, uh, to put uh, 40 billion cubic meters of gas a year through Ukrainian pipelines until 2024. Well, could the Germans talk to Gazprom and get that contract extended? That would be a material benefit to Ukraine. Or could you know, some of the uh, companies or some of the consumers of uh, Russian gas say, we're not gonna buy it at Nord Stream 2, We'll buy that gas on the Russia-Ukraine border, and we'll then take responsibility for transit in Europe. There are things that could be done that I think would keep some amount of money going to the Ukrainians. You could do something similar with the Poles. Uh, and there, uh, there's a variety of other ideas out there. But at the end of the day, that would allow the Biden administration to say, we're going to continue the waiver of these sanctions. We're going to let the pipeline be completed. We'll avoid that rift with Germany. But here are some things that we got that are beneficial to Ukraine and Poland, the two countries that lose most by Nord Stream 2's completion. So um, I think that's a really thoughtful approach. And I actually am personally somewhat relieved at uh, the way things are developing on this issue now, because it seems like they bought space for uh, good old diplomacy and some, and some horse trading. Um, I want to talk for a second about uh, Russia's internal trajectory. Um, one of the um, things that's hard to um, take your eye off is essentially the downward spiral of the economy. Um, and it's not just sanctions. It's also just being cut off increasingly from, uh, from uh, the West, from technology, from capital, uh, and from you know, the, just the abiding sense that it is um, uh, somehow becoming more autarkic, more, more um, the, the whole integration piece has, has uh, dissolved. And, uh, you know, energy prices have been relatively low. They could go lower. You never know. Anyone who predicts the energy markets is, you know, pretty foolish. But uh, what they're certainly not doing, as you mentioned in your discussion of the Russian uh, Silicon Valley, they're, they're certainly not developing... Um, an entrepreneurial class in, in Russia. And how does um, Putin play the continued deterioration of the economy, which he seems to show uh, very little interest in? And what is the role in this constellation of the oligarchs? They seem to be shut out and without influence and just uh, there to be uh, taxed and supportive at the moment. Yeah, no, it's um, interesting. I mean, there was oh, several years ago, the Russians announced several national projects on medical care, housing, things like that, that would address the problems. Mm -hmm. And I think they're trying to sort of build some floors so that things don't deteriorate too far. But it does not appear that there's a long term plan for getting the economy modernized. I mean, it's not it doesn't look like a 21st century economy. And increasingly, it's not going to close the gap with the United States or China or Europe. It's going to lag, I think, further and further behind. Uh, 
and, and this is one of those things with you have the oligarchs. Uh, again, most of the oligarchs, they aren't innovative. You know, they're not looking for competition. I mean, one of the reasons why they're drawn so close to the Kremlin is the Kremlin protects their favored positions in the economy. And in fact, one of the sad things about the Russian economy is if you look at the proportion of the economy that is now state controlled, either it's owned outright by the state or care sale companies, it's actually increased significantly over the last 10 years. Uh, I, I think that's in the, in the wrong direction because again, I don't think the oligarchs are gonna be uh, dynamic engineers of economic growth. Um, but it gets back to the problem I mentioned is I think creating that kind of economy is going to require more openness than the Kremlin is now prepared to consider. And it's something that I, I think the controlling group, the, the guys, are, that inner circle, they seem to have a very much a short-term view. Uh, one, one person basically cynically described to me says, they basically want to take care of themselves and their families. And you know what happens to Russia 10 or 15 years down the road, who cares? Now, I don't think that's Putin's view, but you know, at some point he's got to figure out a different strategy because when he does depart the scene, uh, I think he's leaving his successor a huge pile of problems that are going to be far more difficult to uh, to deal with. And uh, again, this overemphasis on control uh, again is is preventing the kind of economic developments. And it's not just folks in the West, but uh, Alexei Kudrin, who was the mastermind of the Russian economy in the early Putin years, and reportedly still has a good relationship, but he regularly criticizes Putin on economics and said Putin is making fundamental mistakes that are going to have a negative impact on the economy in the future. And uh, at the current rate, I don't see much reason to expect there's going to be change. So if we postulate uh, continued decline in economic uh, output, um, what uh, what do you think the chances are of real domestic unrest? I mean, we already have the Navalny phenomenon, and um, you know it's always hard to predict uh, how people are going to behave. But in general, the immiseration of the masses leads to people to be you know ready for something else. Yeah, but uh, but Russians can take a lot. <laughs> can take a lot. No, I, yeah. I mean I, that, that to my mind is a stunning difference between Russia and Ukraine. Yeah. So the big, the biggest demonstrations in Russia were after the 2011 uh, parliamentary elections, and you had maybe 100,000 people, 120,000 people show out in the streets of Moscow. And that's a big demonstration for Russia. That's 120,000 people in a city of what, 14 million. In Kiev, at the height of the Maidan Revolution, uh, after there'd been police attacks on students, in a city of 3 million, you had between 500 and 700,000 people on the streets. Uh, so I, I think what you see in Russia is a population that is much prepared to accept deprivation. They, they've done it historically. Um, and this is though, I think is a challenge for the Kremlin is when they put the straw on the camel's back that breaks the back, you know, how do you know that in advance? I mean, that's only something that you know when large numbers of people take to the streets. Now, as for Navalny, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I mean, Navalny's popularity rating was actually quite small. I think about 15, 20% approval rating. Uh, so the Russian population hasn't gravitated towards any focal point uh, in terms of a person as an opponent to Putin. And Putin's been quite effective about keeping uh, other Navalny's sort of in invisible. So I, I don't exclude it from happening, but what Putin seems to be relying on is one, the population is not generally disposed to protest. Two, uh, that he can use themes like nationalism and Russia is a great actor on the world stage to buy off part of the population, uh, at least get them to disregard the fact that their economic circumstances are worse. And three, he's built a fairly significant mechanism for repression uh, should he be wrong on his assumption that people won't take to the streets? Right. Um, so one question that comes up uh, from our viewers, but also, you know, endless discussions still in political science and, and uh, other circles, um, 
as someone who was at the heart of the uh, um, of the policy move to enlarge NATO, how, how do you feel about it now? Um, I, I guess I think NATO enlargement still makes sense. And let me explain why. Um, NATO enlarged, uh, did it, it, it's big wave of enlargement, uh, you know, when they took in seven members was in 2002, and that included three Baltic states, or they were invited to join, they joined in 2004. And Mr. Putin didn't kick up much of a fuss then. I, I think, you know, the, a, a good part of the opposition that you've seen to NATO that has come out of the Kremlin over the last seven to eight years is less about NATO enlargement and more about Mr. Putin looking for something to use to rally the Russian people. Uh, so if that's correct, I mean, if a lot of this is driven by his response to his inability to deliver on the economics you know, and, and try to sort of present Russia as an aggrieved power, I guess I would wonder, what, let's do the counterfactual. What if NATO had not enlarged? And then to get back to your earlier question, uh, I would be a whole lot more worried about the Baltic states. Uh, again, I, I think there were times when NATO enlarged, we probably could have been a bit more creative in terms of how we shaped the NATO-Russia relationship. There was also just you know, a bad accident of history. I mean, less than two years after you conclude the NATO-Russia founding act and you're beginning to shape a NATO-Russia relationship, NATO goes to war against Serbia and that sets everything back. Then there was a restart though with Mr. Putin in 2002 and this sort of relaunch of the operation, uh, but there didn't seem to be much traction. And again, I think the West probably could have been a bit more creative, but it was hard to see any creative ideas coming from the Russians on this. And to some extent, I think there has been this decision by uh, Putin and the Kremlin uh, that it's useful for them to have some sort of a foreign threat and US and NATO, United States and NATO enlargement fill that box. But I think that's as much about domestic political issues within Russia as it is about uh, foreign policy questions. I mean, if you see in Moscow, I mean, looking at NATO, yes, NATO enlarged, you know, but you know, up until 2014, defense budgets are coming down, forces are being cut back. Um, yeah, and as I said, until 2014, you know, NATO did not deploy any ground formations on the territory of new members. Uh, it wasn't a military threat, uh, but uh, I think Putin chose to portray it as such. Uh, let me try out a hypothesis on you. Um, <clears throat> there was going to be a reaction against NATO inevitably at some point as Russia's um, uh, fortunes uh, waned and that there was going to be a, uh, someone was going to play the nationalist card and that uh, given that set of circumstances, it really did make a lot of sense to expand the zone of security a little more effectively um, when the opportunity presented itself uh, because, precisely because it was inevitable. Yeah, well, I think there's all, but, but also going back to the time, I mean, you know, early 1990s, again, the perception of Russia is one, it's not a threat. Uh, and, and, and Russia you know, at that point was going through huge internal uh, problems. Right. Um, but, and I think the, the driving factor for NATO enlargement for the first 10 years was less so about Russia than more so about underpinning the democratic and political changes that were taking place in places like Poland and the Czech Republic and Hungary, uh, in, in part because the European Union institutionally could not move as quickly. And so it, it was about anchoring those countries into something at a time when at least there was a hope that Russia would not reemerge as a threat, that hope turned out to be wrong. So um, a number of uh, viewers have asked if you would uh, go into a little more detail about how Russia tries to undermine the EU and maybe uh, you could also address the relationship it has with um, uh, one EU uh, member, Hungary in particular, which uh, has become somewhat uh, problematic. Well, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I think, you know, the EU is a combination of a lot of different countries and, and some of them are more sympathetic to Russia. If you're in Hungary, um, where I think Mr. Orban has moved in a very authoritarian direction, um, you know, there's a certain affinity there between Moscow and, and Budapest. Uh, 
And to the extent that Russia can use that to drive some wedges within the European Union, uh, they're going to play that card. Um, and and Hungary is also, I mean, it's, it's also a divisive element within NATO. So, for example, basically uh, most NATO Ukraine things now are blocked because of a Hungarian dispute with uh, Ukraine that Hungary has chosen to put into the NATO context when it really is a bilateral issue. So I, I think the Russians are going to look at to look at somebody like President Zeman in, in the Czech Republic. You know, or even though the Czech Republic has now you know, expelled uh, I think probably 80 uh, Russian diplomats, there's a president who still is basically is, is, is lining up on the Russian side on that issue. So they're looking for players like that, that to sow division. Um, I think the challenge, though, for the European Union uh, has been, uh, again, to me, a pleasant surprise is at least holding the Union together on sanctions on Russia uh, has been pretty impressive. When these sanctions technically require uh, a consensus to renew, but even though you've got Hungary, uh, Greece, Italy that are questioning the sanctions, they still seem to get renewed. And, and so the Russians have had you know, some effect, but I think on some questions, they've not been as effective as they might uh, in terms of undermining EU unity. I also think the treatment of Burrell was just, just a, a stupid mistake. Just, it was so humiliating and, and so clearly designed to be a humiliation that I think it actually provoked a reaction and, and a lot of thinking in European capitals. And again, just reiterating this, this idea that maybe the assessment of Russian intentions uh, needs to be revised. They, they do sort of seem to be addicted to gratuitous behavior sometimes. Uh, that's uh, certainly undermined uh, Russian policy at many different points. Um, so um, I think we're getting to the witching hour, but I did want to ask you one final question, and this is weaving together some of the other uh, thoughts that our viewers have sent in. Um, how, uh, how optimistic or pessimistic are you about the notion of um, thoroughgoing Western coordination on Russia policy? Um, obviously, a million different variables to calculate in there, but from where you uh, sit um, before the Robert Bosch Academy uh, background right now, uh, how are you feeling about the capabilities of the Biden administration, the willingness and um, uh, interest of uh, European partners? Um, let me say um, moderately optimistic, uh, because I do, I do think that the Biden administration's approach, I mean, for, well, first of all, the fact that it's Joe Biden and not second term of uh, Donald Trump, you know, that's, that's a very positive thing in European capitals. Uh, but I, I do think with the Biden administration, there will be an effort to reach out to consult, uh, to talk more. And I think we've seen in the handling of Nord Stream 2, there's an understanding that there are poli real politics in, in European countries that have to be taken account of. Uh, but as I said, I think it's going to get back to, um, on the American side, trying to get the balance that Europe has between engagement and, and business ties and things like that, and the necessity to push back to try to get that adjusted a little bit more in favor of the pushback. Uh, and then perhaps being on the American side, being prepared to say, okay, well, we'll, we'll be prepared to engage a bit more and, and maybe get those two balances a bit more aligned on both sides. Uh, it'll also help, I mean, we, we still, and, and this is uh, quite normal, unfortunately, in American politics is, it still would be nice to get the full Biden team on board. So a lot of those consultations, I think that that you know, will take place, probably are still awaiting you know people to get confirmed and into positions. Uh, and again, I I think that there certainly is going to be readiness on both sides to try to make this coordination work. It's helpful that in Europe, the assessment of Russian and Russian intentions, I think, is moving more in the direction of the American one. So that there may now be a better chance to link up on policies. Though I suspect at the end of the day, um, the American side is always going to be a bit more hawkish than the Europeans on that. And again, on the American side, perhaps we ought to understand that, that because you know, Europe has the issue of proximity. And when you're talking about business and trade sanctions, we need to bear in mind that you know, it's a much bigger deal for European economies than for the US economy. Yeah, so uh, all good points. Uh, I would just add that there's uh, the curious situation now in the US that you have um, the Germans have a great word for it, Nachholbedarf, pent-up demand 
uh, on the Republican side to do some good Russia bashing since they had to hold their tongues for uh, the last four years. But um, it's certainly an interesting challenge. And um, we will continue to, to watch this space. So this is the point in the event where I usually say, um, it's been great having you. And uh, I'm only sorry that we're uh, separated by 4,000 miles. And we really look forward to having you back um, in, in the flesh in Berlin. Well, you're in the flesh in Berlin. Yeah, we're, but only, we're only about four miles apart right now. I know, but uh, let me say that anyway, Steve. It's always great to listen to you. And um, we look forward to having you back and live at the Academy so we can uh, appear uh, on the same uh, platform. And uh, I want to thank you uh, tremendously for lots and lots of great insights. Let me just tell uh, our viewers um, that, uh, again, I'm delighted you joined us and thanks for all the great questions. And I'm sorry I couldn't get to every last one of them. Uh, I do want to tell you uh, that we have another uh, event coming up uh, on Tuesday, May 25th, uh, with Andrew Grotto, who, uh, like uh, Steve, is a veteran of the American um, National Security Council staff. Uh, but he is going to be talking about something very different. Uh, it, automobiles and the convergence of safety, cybersecurity, and privacy risks. And that should be a really interesting discussion that will address um, the next generation of smart cars, which um, have more uh, computing power than um, uh, all the Apollo spaceships and probably lots more than that. Um, Steve, it's been great having you, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your time in Berlin and uh, continue to uh, 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 treat us to your wisdom on these important issues. So all the best. Dan, thanks very much for having me, and I look forward to having an opportunity to come back maybe in some time and do it in person. Great. Uh, consider the invitation uh, in the mail. Okay. okay. Take care. Bye now. Bye-bye.